Hello my brothers and sisters of the Order, welcome back to the Order, I'm Celtic Templar, and yes y'all, today for our firearms history, we are actually going to, well, mortars, early mortars to be more precise. And in such, I know this is not war, uh, firearms and such are uh, not entirely with the mortars and such, or mortars are not labeled underneath the firearms class, uh, but this actually came down to me through a comment from one of my uh, viewers. Now, I apologize, it took me a while to make this, I was planning on having it for the uh, uh, American History videos for uh, Independence Month, and unfortunately it uh, kind of got out of here a little late, I know, because unfortunately I have to do a lot of studying and research on this thing, and early mortars are kind of difficult to look up. So... Yeah, it's not exactly that easy to take a look at them. Now, mostly when we hear the term of early mortar, we automatically think of the American Civil War. We, and pretty much that's it. I know, that's actually really weird, but yeah, that's what most people actually think of an early mortar is just that. But in such, the early mortar has actually been seen in history, especially from the years of 1413 till 1870. One. You now it did actually been used for a long time and such, so when was this actually first used? It's actually, well, this is actually what I really find it really cool, is the fact that it was first used in Korea. And it was known as the uh, Wanju, I think it was called, Wanju, or I don't know if I'm mispronouncing it in any way, and in which is known as the gourd-shaped mortar. Now, it was actually stated this would have been the first, uh, naval engagement that a mortar would ever be seen and used in. And in such, yes, mortars have also been used in naval warfare, but in which I will be getting to that very soon. And in such, the first siege it had ever seen was actually at Constantinople by the Ottoman Turks in 1453. Now, I want to put this out here. Uh, mortars are extremely dangerous, especially the early ones. Now, before anyone starts thinking that m all mortars look like the modern day, no. They always look like something like this thing, or in such, were just a big giant cannon, only this time pointed up. So, how dangerous were these things? Very dangerous. One to the fact you had to load it from the muzzle, like a modern mortar, except it uh, is not that easy like a modern mortar. One to the fact it has to be rammed in just like a, well, early cannon. Another problem is, too, these things were extremely heavy, depending on the model. Mostly if it's meant for siege warfare, then yes, it is going to be heavier. However, if it was, say, uh, the naval mortars, it's actually stated the naval mortars were slightly smaller. I don't know if that's understandable, but yeah, we can understand why. Which I think we can all understand why, though. It's uh, because you have to have it smaller, but I think I should get that out very soon. Now, I want to put this out here. There are also many vet conflicts that these things would have seen, but that we will go to soon. Another also major drawback of mortars was number three, was be the fact that they are very inaccurate with their hit, or inaccurate with their hit, whichever way you want to pronounce it, and in such have actually been known to stray aside because of the way it elevated. So, these things were not easy, but we'll under soon understand and talk about how they would have actually done their aiming. Now, first actually, let's actually talk about the gourd-shaped mortar. Well, the gourd-shaped mortar, well, was a gourd shape the way it was designed. Now, why was it designed like this? Simple. The way that the Koreans actually wanted to do it was to make sure it had enough blast radius to launch the shell into the said enemy ship. Which is kind of a very impressive design. And as such, there was more gunpowder at the very base, or the very bottom, of the gourd. Meaning, there's a lot more gunpowder in there than there is a cannonball. And as such, this is actually what was majorly famous about it. It could easily just take cannon shot, only now, 
it can hover it over a little bit more of an elevated distance. Meaning it, say for example, if you're in a stone wall fortification, it doesn't matter anymore. You're still going to get yourself killed. And in fact, that's why the mortar was keen to siege warfare, and in such was seen a lot more with siege warfare than cannons were. Now, I want to put this out here, y'all. Uh, whenever we hear of siege warfare, there's automatically supposed to be a mortar. And in fact, the first siege with Constantinople is a good example to this. In fact, the mortar shells were stated to have landed over the said city walls. Now, I hear many people already asking, but Templar, why couldn't they just use a big giant bombard like they were known to have done? Well, that's what they did. Problem is, Constantinople... Uh, Constantinople, how should I put this, was uh, many layers of wall. So in other words, it didn't matter if you actually got fur through the first wall, they had to deal with a second wall and another wall until it's near impossible. Now, if none of y'all understand how would this be and why, simple. Constantinople was pretty much the heart of Byzantium. They needed to protect it. And in such, it did actually withstand, hold, and pretty much use its form of defensive for hundreds of years. So, pretty much mortars kind of changed that, the same with cannons. However, the uh, mortars the Ottoman Turks used were a lot bigger. And when I mean a lot bigger, I mean like steroids bigger. And such, we think that our modern mortars are big. <laughs> Uh, let's, let's say um, you do not want to be anywhere near this thing. I don't have an image of it because this is very hard to find. And in fact, the shell radius of it would be about yay big in diameter. See my point? That big in diameter? If that's the shell the in diameter form, just imagine how big the mortar was. That thing must have been huge, and the Ottoman Turks were known to have actually constructed a uh, easily constructed cannon w into two parts, which uh, Terry Shepard actually talks about this in the Last Crusaders episode. If any of y'all want to see that, uh, I will leave a link to it very soon for y'all. Uh, now, I want to put this out here. When it comes down to it, the history behind mortars is very vague, and in such, Europeans did start using mortars, but very rarely. Now, it is stated, though, mostly they just took big giant bombards and just put a ramp on them, and to elevate them to actually fire into a city rather than destroy a wall. Now, many of you might start asking Templar, why would they do that? It would just make the siege last a little longer. Not exactly. Because the fact is, it's a lot more horrifying for a defender to see a freaking boulder uh, ammunition or cannonball, or whatever you pronounce it as, at the time, coming down at him from above rather than it going through a breaching of the wall. And in fact, you can easily have forces man that area that in which the wall had been breached. And here's another thing, even if the city has been taken, guess what, if it's a breached wall, you don't exactly uh, have the said suitable manpower to hold it off, seeing as though enemy reinforcements are coming right after you. So, this is where it kind of gets a little difficult for our history books. So, where do we actually understand the history on mortars entirely when it changes over time? Well, mortars do change over time. However, they evolved in a certain way over time in history, such as for history, take a look at history. They somewhat go from the heavier form and down to a lighter form, which this is where I find the history of mortars weird, is because it went from naval engagement mortar, which was extremely light, to heavy bombard a mortar, that which is meant for siege warfare, and then it goes back to light warfare, and which is not rarely used. And, and here's the thing, when I mean not rarely, I mean non-existent at all. In fact, it's actually stated that these mortars were mostly used by naval warfare, not by, well, siege warfare. And in fact, it was a big rarity you ever heard of a siege ever taking place 
mostly in European history, especially by, say, the 15 or 1600s. However, there were the star-shaped uh, outposts or fortresses that actually were stated to stop cannonballs. So, we can probably understand that these smaller mortars might have been used, or as well, they might have started bringing in the big bombard mortars still. But, the one thing I do find a little hilarious about the smaller mortars used by Europeans was the fact that these things were made of either uh, brass or bronze. And in fact, when we actually understand the noise this one makes, uh, I want to put this out to y'all. If any of y'all have ever heard the ping out of an M1 Garand, which, yes, I pronounce it M1 Garand, because that's the way the guy wants his name to be pronounced, uh, we understand that the noise makes that little clip sound makes a loud pinging noise. Well, think that with these bronze mortars, only the ping is slightly louder, in which it has been known to cussicate, uh, which this is a weird word that I found out about what they called it, in which destroys the eardrums. And in such, it's actually stated that mortar crews, what they would have done, is they would have actually uh, stuffed their ears with cotton wads, or whatever they can get their hands on, because the fact is, it is so loud when it goes off. Which, that could actually explain why many naval commanders in history would rather not use a mortar. In fact, it's actually stated that many frigates or even man of wars rarely use the mortar unless they were going for siege warfare. But, as I said, we'll get to that very soon. Now, when we take a look in history about the, well, evolution of the mortar, it did evolve, and it did so quickly. Now, I hear many people already. Templar, how did it evolve? Well, it transformed from the bombard to this thing somehow recently and quickly. Especially by the time of the Seven Years' War, or as it was also known here in the Americas, the French and Indian War. And in such, had evolved in the form like this, so that way it can fire and lobby bigger shells into such as, say, areas, and as well have a little much more of accuracy. Now, this is where it actually all changes, and in such, it's actually stated that many times over, European armies would have evolved their military to actually train their mortar crews to hit the target rightly. And in such, they would have had a mortar scale device, meaning they would actually take what you might call a string and it would just hang down with a small lead weight. They would actually, this is actually one of the weirdest ways to actually uh, aim at a target. They would actually use the weight on the said end of the mortar and in such level to where they need to hit. So, did this work? Surprisingly, yes, it actually did. And, in fact, uh, if you all want to see it, uh, like an uh, example of this, I will try and find a link for you all for Lock and Load and Gun the Art of the Army, who in which actually does a video on this, on mortars or artillery and such. So, and such though, the mortar does evolve in its way, but it was so rarely ever used on history. In fact, the only time we ever hear it being used is either in a siege warfare or in naval warfare and is never used in the front lines. Reason was it's too damn heavy. Even the lighter mortars that were actually were used by naval forces were very rarely used and were mostly only used by the British Marines. That's right, only Marines of the British Army were known to have actually done this. And even then it was very rare to them have ever done so. In fact uh, the major problem about this is, little, these little mortars were not exactly the best and brightest idea to actually, well, for anyone to actually use. And in fact, it's actually stated that the HMS Vulture actually carried at least five of these. And in such, it later disbanded them when more better type of artillery started to come around. So we can understand why. However, even during the American Revolution, it's actually stated that even the city of New York, and as well, even the Battle of Bunker Hill, were mostly impacted with mortar rounds, not with artillery fire. Which, we probably might need to fix that, but eh. But, so, I hear maybe already saying and asking, 
Simple art, doesn't this mean that the mortar is a lot more better than the cannon? Yes and no, because it depended on the shell it fired. And in such, there were two types of shells that were used. By the time of the American Revolution, there were. However, prior before that, there was nothing more than the regular cannonball, which was mostly a fragmental uh, impact shell. So, I hear many of you already asking, Templar, what the hell is a fragmental impact shell? Simple. It, as soon as it hits, say, something hard like pavement or a house or something, it immediately turns into shrapnel wads and disperses everywhere, which is kind of the most horrifying thing. That was until a timed fuse shell came around, and the shell started blowing up over your head. Yeah, I don't even know how bad that is, but that's, uh, that is just messed up beyond measure. Because one thing I do not want is something blowing up right above my head and having it come down right above me. So, even then, we can understand why these things were so dangerous. But in such, it is stated though that these would have been rarely used, especially in the American Revolution. However, uh, and now I want to put this out here, there are a couple of films I have seen, especially with American Revolution involved or the Seven Years War involved, such as the Patriot film, which does not, uh, they show it, but it does not show it in its correct role at one point, especially with field battles. However, we do see it at the Battle of Yorktown slightly, which is a good thing, which it's meant to be used, and the such it was meant to be used for. Siege Warfare! Now, in the battle, and you know, here's a major thing, uh, there is a film known as The Last of Mohicans, in which we see the uh, sieging area of, say, the said fortress, with the French actually besieging the area with mortar shells. So, another good example. So, now I am ready for you already. Templar, doesn't this mean that the mortar was a little bit more used during that time? Yes, because they were trying to take care of uh, said fortifications. Problem is, it was not that much used on the field of battle. In fact, field military use, it was too damn heavy. And in fact, they did try and come up with a better uh, solution by attaching wheels to these things, which was not a very good idea because these things were known to accidentally go backwards a lot faster than a regular cannon, which was why they dismantled those immediately. I think this actually happened sometime during the War of 1812, and in such, it's actually stated that a British Marine Dragoon Division, I can't remember which battle it was, but I know it took place somewhere in Canada, uh, between the Canadian forces and the United States forces, Apparently, the Canadians had actually brought the mortar in, which was a new service. It accidentally went backwards and ended up killing, maiming, or injuring, especially a couple, several soldiers, and including one lieutenant colonel that was leading the siege. It did not end well, so they kind of got rid of him incredibly quickly, which I would too if that was me that was getting hit by that thing. Uh, but fast forward a little while later, especially to the Texas Revolution, the mortar is actually still being seen and used. However, it's actually stated that Santa Ana himself would have actually used the mortars, but he did not like them because they were too slow. And such, he was even stated to have actually discarded them on his way trying to chase after none other than Sam Houston until he got defeated at the Battle of San Jacinto, which we can understand was his major downfall. So, why were early mortars so heavy? Simple. It was mostly made out of heavy steel and iron in order to keep the thing from busting open. In fact, it's actually stated that in order to actually keep this thing to uh, fire this heavy shell, which was a lot different, they had to use a lot more gunpowder than they would use with normal cannons. So, yeah, I can understand why someone did not want to actually uh, die which is kind of a good example to it. So, what is it the difference between that type of timeline and such? Well, we can easily see the fact that if Santa Ana had actually used them mostly, they would have been a lot helpful. But, uh, in fact, it's actually stated that many of those mortars and artillery pieces he left behind are still being looked for by many Texas historians. 
However, if we also fast forward later on in history, especially to the Mexican-American War, we actually later on see it used on the city of none other than Mexico City. And in such, it's interesting that the United States forces had actually used the mortars, especially none other than UCS Grant, using the mortars especially to bombard the areas all around the said city. Now, a little while long before this, also with Napoleon Bonaparte, it actually favored the can well, mortar design system in order to destroy cities, especially used by the German or Prussian or Holy Roman Empire, whatever you want to pronounce it at the time, or German estates, to besiege them and technically take the over. Problem is, as soon after taking over said region, he would stop using them entirely for siege warfare, especially when he headed further east. Problem is, though, that's my major drawback on, especially my view, uh, when it came down to these mortars. They were too damn heavy to deal with, so... Yeah, it did not end well. However, that all changed during the American Civil War. And in such, the United States military had actually started to, well, place heavy mortars on their said, well, trains. Which was kind of a really cool idea, an impressive idea, especially when it came to the uh, Siege of Vicksburg. We actually see and hear mortars being used, both from fixed fortifications and as well gunboats. These are armored gunboats that have actually been remodified to take in the pressure of a heavy mortar. And such, this is why most of the time the little mortar was now being discarded for the heavy mortar, which was mostly meant for siege warfare. Because, you gotta admit, it'd be a lot more horrifying facing that thing than a small little tiny one. And in such, the siege mortars were actually incredibly gruesome. Ulysses Grant later on stated on how much the city would burn and destroy itself, especially with the fact that the mortars go right over the fortifications, causing a more quicker, indecisive surrender. So... Technically, Grant was kind of right to explain of how gruesome these things were and of how dangerous these things were. In fact, it's actually stated that the cities would be so laid to rubble we could barely understand what they would have looked like. One Union soldier even stated that upon marching through the city of Vicksburg, it seemed as though it was a ghost town that which was lit to a blaze. Rubble was falling, debris was coming down upon us, and as well, it seemed as though the smoke would not let up. This is all when they actually tried to charge through the city. We can even hear this at the Battle of Petersburg, and as well many other Civil War engagements, especially with the siege warfare. So, technically, it was an impressive idea entirely. Problem is, though, it still had a major drawback, which was the weight in transportation. So, yeah. The Americans of War still had a major problem. However, the final time it would ever be used with a heavy siege mortar like this would actually be used during the Franco-Prussian War in 1870-1871. And in such, these type of artillery pieces were actually not being used by, well, the Prussians, but actually used by none other than the French. In fact, it's actually stated that the French stated that they would use these while sieging none other than the city of Berlin. Problem is, though, they never even got a chance to use them. However, the Prussians did, and they used their own, the enemy used own, well, weapons against them. Uh, but even by then, that thing was outdated, and as such, the Prussians had actually modified their own artillery for the new designs. So, the mortar was being left behind entirely. However, we can understand why this thing was still being used for siege warfare in the Navy, until it would later on be replaced by bigger and more powerful uh, type of, well, cannons. However, though, we can understand that the time and timeline it would later on be replaced was technically understand. But, in such, the mortar would come back during World War I, only remodified to look like a miniature howitzer. So, I can understand the fact that mortars were incredibly dangerous, even back then. So, how heavy were these things? Well, it depended on which one we're talking about and on which timeline, because there are many variations. Some Civil War uh, type of 
heavy artillery has actually been known to be over at least 300 pounds. I don't know how bad that would be for the people in the, to get shot by that thing, but I really don't want to be anywhere near it. And in such, I can't explain to y'all that siege warfare was the main part why these things were used. They were meant to get the shell over the fortifications rather than just blowing a hole constantly into a fortification line, knowing it's never going to work. In fact, for example, we can easily see at the Siege of Petersburg that in such, we needed to actually bombard the said area in order to bring down the rebel army. And in such, though, the Confederates didn't exactly surrender. But it did break their morale enough, seeing the fact that their homes are being destroyed entirely by mortars alone. And, and such, we only see a couple of video games. In fact, I only mostly see them in the video game, uh, or two video games, uh, which are Civil War. Which, this is an old history channel made type of video game that was back during when PS2 was the king. So... Still, though, it's a very old game, but if any of y'all want to check it out, be my guest. But in such, we can understand that mortars are incredibly dangerous because they were so dangerous in history. And in such, were either used by those that were besieging an area or those that were under siege. In fact, it's actually stated that in the American Civil War, that Fort Ticonderoga was actually had at least, I want to say, 15 to 20 mortars taken from that area and used by the Continental Army. So we can understand how incredibly dangerous these things were and as well loved by the said armies because they needed them to besiege heavy fortifications. And without them, we might have not actually won at the Battle of Yorktown at all. So, again, admit, they did actually were used pretty much in their correct way, but then there are those idiots that think that they can actually be used on fields of battle. They were not because they were too damn heavy. In fact, don't believe me, ask the Canadians. Anyways guys, hopefully you liked this video. Like and subscribe for more. If you have any ideas for firearms history, let me know in the comments below. And as well, we will hopefully get right down to it as soon as possible. This has been your host, Celtic Templar, and hopefully see you all in the next one. Mm -hmm.